Hi, Dave Blocks. I'm with you from Beyond Guitars, and thank you for joining me at the workbench. Uh, today, I want to discuss some things and get some input from you. If you'd like to leave some comments, I'd like to see what you have to think about some of the things I have coming up. Uh, I've got uh, some projects. I've been away for a little bit because I've had outside guitar banjo stuff to do. And I think I may start another channel too, just to show you the other stuff that I do. I've already um, repaired an antique uh, Winchester rifle and I'm in the middle of repairing a fence in a unique way that I've never seen done before. And uh, so I've got other things with my cars and things going on. So I think that may be the catch-all for the stuff I do that's not uh, instrument related. But today I want to discuss some things, some upcoming projects. This is a wood song guitar that uh, needs to have the uh, f the fretboard leveled. It's kind of like the, the waves of the ocean. And whether it was made that way or it warped a little bit after it was made, I'm not sure. But it buzzes like crazy. Now this one I'm kind of in the middle of actually. I started this a while back and then I got interrupted with back surgery so I kind of dropped it but I need to pick it up again and uh, all I've really done is take the strings off and pull a few of the frets so there's not a lot uh, you've missed so far but this one I want to get um, get fixed again. It will make a nice player. Kind of unique guitars too. I'll discuss that with you when I get to it. I'm also uh, in the middle of another project. It's a, a parts banjo and most banjo folks have considered maybe building a parts banjo and what a parts banjo is, if you've watched any of my videos, you know there are a lot of parts. There's over a hundred parts to a banjo but you know sometimes you can kind of swap them around and make different things out of them. Well I've been accumulating some Gibson banjo parts and uh, so I'd like to uh, put those together. And I have a Earl Scruggs standard neck that I bought uh, with some problems. And of course I like buying stuff with problems because I like to solve the problem. And I've done most of the problem solving, but I have one that I haven't approached yet. And that's what I want to discuss with you in this video right here. So uh, I'm going to bring that out onto the workbench and show you what's going on with that Earl Scruggs neck and hopefully I can get some input from you. I'll discuss with you the things that I've thought of to repair it and the thing that I've kind of decided to do but I haven't done it yet so it's not too late to pull the plug on that idea. Um, so let's get to it. I'll show you what I'm talking about. <laughs> Okay, so here it is in all its glory. It uh, <laughs> This is a project I've had for a lot of years. Actually, I've been playing this banjo, but uh, it's reached the point now where I really want to fix it right and finish it. Uh, I haven't got a resonator finished for it, but I have a resonator for it. It's a brand new one, so that is a non-Gibson part, but it's a handmade, very, very well-made resonator. And I've got to do a lot of work on that. It's not finished. It doesn't have the concentric rings installed. So we've got a lot of work to do just on the resonator. Uh, the pot itself is just to find. Uh, this is an older Gibson pot. This is a 1988 uh, Gibson Master Tone pot, a Greg Rich era. So it's a really nice sounding banjo. And I have played it, so I know it sounds really great. Now, what I want to uh, talk about, that's just work I have to do. No real decisions in that. Uh, per se that are very interesting and exciting but uh, I'm going to take this neck off now and show you what I've got going and what my problem is and what I've done. I have done extensive extensive work on this neck. In fact it doesn't look like it but this neck has had so much work done to it and I have not refretted it and I have not leveled the fretboard and uh I have done something to this neck that I have never heard of anyone doing and I did it in a way that nobody would have dreamed of. So let me get this neck off here and I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, now as I say, I bought this neck with uh, 
it was a great deal because it had a major problem. Um, I may have been just the right person to buy this, but <laughs> I bought it uh, some years ago. It's got some real nice tiger uh, striping to the maple. It's a beautiful neck, uh, Gibson Earl Scruggs standard. Now, one thing I don't have for it is the signature Earl Scruggs uh, truss rod cover. I would like to have one, but I don't see any available. So I'm not sure. I guess I'll just put a regular truss rod cover on it when I'm done. Well, this banjo neck had a broken truss rod. And broken truss rods, you've always heard of them. I've never broken one myself, but this one was sheared off completely and it was um, broken somewhere near the top, but it had broken completely off. So um, I was determined to repair that and I actually replaced the truss rod in this neck without taking the neck apart. It had a two-way truss rod installed. You can take off the tension and put on some uh, compression on it and actually bend the neck the opposite direction. So that's what a two-way truss rod is for. I could tell why they broke it because the neck also has some, some warpage to it. Now I've kind of already addressed the warpage. I used a heat method on it to straighten the neck and it's nice. It plays well now and uh, the truss rod works. What I did here was really kind of odd. I will I will give you that. This was kind of an odd project, but I was determined to get that truss, truss rod out. Now, if you know how a truss rod is installed, it's got an anchor point at each end. And because it's anchored, uh, it's usually laid in from the top with the fretboard removed or before it's installed. And you install the truss rod and then the fretboard is glued on. But I didn't want to mess up the finish, so I didn't want to unglue the fretboard, which I could have done, but I certainly bought myself a challenge. What, uh, what I ended up doing, since it was broken at the top, I didn't really have much to do at this end. At the bottom end, however, there was plenty to do. You can see there's a pretty sizable hole right here in the neck. And uh, I drilled that hole to get the truss rod in and out. And I was able to kind of uh, loosen it up here at the bottom end. I only could extract it from the top. So what I did was I made a, uh, I took a rod, a kind of a uh, quarter inch rod of steel, and I drilled the end of the rod out so it was hollow, and I used that as my extraction tool, and it took a lot of pressure to get this truss rod out of here. A dual acting truss rod was in this neck, but I shoved that rod in here. I did do, do a little drilling, but I just didn't have enough wood here to be able to pass uh, what was left of that plate here at the bottom out. And you know that that supports two rods. There's actually two rods in a dual action truss rod. So uh, to make a long story just as long as possible, uh, I took that long rod of quarter inch steel, I hollowed out the end and I glued it with epoxy onto the stump of the truss rod that was in there, hoping that it would be strong enough for me to extract it. And I'll tell you, I. I had to pull on that very, very hard and uh, use slide hammer techniques to get it out. But it continued to move and it took a couple days and I actually got the truss rod completely out of this neck. And then the next thing was to install a new one. I just didn't have the room to install a new two-way truss rod. So in it today, I have a single action truss rod, which is a lot better than none. So a single action has been the standard for since they invented truss rods. Only recently do more instruments have the dual action type truss rod in them. So I figured, hey, that's good enough for me. Uh, single action truss rod is designed to uh, take out any forward bow that's in the neck if uh, the strings have been pulling on it long enough to make the neck bow and you tighten the truss rod a little bit and it'll straighten it out. So that's really the purpose of it. And now I have a single action truss rod in this uh, Gibson uh, Earl Scruggs standard banjo neck. One day when I was talking to uh, Eric Sullivan who made most of these necks, he actually he made these Sullivan banjos, made all the Gibson necks in the last uh, 30 years or so of their production. I was kind of shocked at the amount of work I went to to save this neck. But uh, it was really more a lesson for me than it was just simply getting a banjo neck to work. Didn't really have to have it. 
but I really wanted to do it. I was pretty motivated. So I have the new truss rod in. I glued in blocks at the ends, so they are all glued up, and uh, it uh, works perfectly, actually. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. And uh, now I have another problem because the truss rod wasn't installed with a bedding material. I was just unable to do that. And now that it's all together, you can hear the truss rod. So that noise that it makes bothers me and you do hear it when you're playing. It's just making some rattling sounds because it's simply the steel rod in there against the maple. So what I need to do now is find a way to cushion that rod or at least uh, support it inside so it doesn't rattle around. Couple of ways I have considered fixing the loose truss rod in here and giving it some bedding material. Well, if you look down in the fifth string tuner hole, and you may not be able to see it, but it's a very deep hole. And it's actually just poking through to the truss rod slot in there. And I could widen that hole with a drill bit carefully, very slowly. You know, I go about things cautiously. So I could open up that hole, and that gives me at least one access point for the truss rod cavity. So I thought I could inject some kind of a material into that, and it should, once I get it down in there, it should spread out and move in both directions, you know, up and down the fretboard, at least enough to keep that rod from shifting around. And if that weren't enough, or because of its central location, I wanted to get some more down in the lower end of the neck, all I need to do is pull one fret, uh, make a little drill in a hole in the middle of the fret slot, and I have direct access then to the truss rod. So I could inject uh, some kind of material through this hole, and I could find any other fret to uh, inject some more if I need to. But I tend to think that being closer to the middle of the neck, the fifth uh, string tuner hole should be, should be adequate. So I could do that and then see how she goes. So what kind of material to inject in there? Uh, first of all, I thought about things like uh, glue or silicone or, you know, all kinds of things you could try. I was thinking of just the idea of construction foam without even knowing how I could even possibly get it in there. But there are some things like that to consider. There's a rubberized kind of caulking material I could use uh, that I've um, used before. It's very strong but very flexible. Uh, I've found it, you know, home improvement stores and stuff. But I don't think there's anything available from a luthier supply that would suit me for this. So let me take you through a little mental journey here, my logic and thinking about the things that are required of whatever I do here. So first of all, it needs to keep the rod from rattling inside the neck. That means it needs to be at least some sort of a solid or a cushiony material, semi-solid. It uh, can't be laid in there directly like you would when you're laying in the truss rod properly. Uh, you'd use a cotton wrap or something like that, but in this case, that's out of the question. So it needs to be kind of a liquidy material I can inject into the neck, into that truss rod slot and then it becomes semi-solid or, or solid, but not glue-like. It can't really harden too much. The rod needs to be at least, you know, have enough flexibility that it can move back and forth a little bit so it can operate properly. So if it were an epoxy or something like that, that would just glue it in permanently. It would be a solid object. So that's not gonna work. That's out of the question. So it needs to be something that won't stick to the rod so I'm thinking of silicone and things like that, but uh, that's not exposed to the air. So it needs to dry without air exposure. So really, instead of a chemical dry or a kind of a polymerized uh, cure, cross-link, which is epoxy, and that's just way too hard, uh, I'm thinking of a thermal hardening, like if I put it in hot and it's melted and then it cools down. I'm thinking of things that can melt and then will solidify, but not too much, of course. And wax comes to mind, but uh, wax we know will melt at a fairly low temperature. So I looked up different kinds of waxes, and wax really seems ideal because 
it will take up the space and it won't you know lock the rod in place and I'm thinking about some kind of wax that melts above hot car temperature now I wouldn't want you to ever put an instrument of any kind in a hot car it's really destructive but I have to keep that in mind because people do that and I certainly wouldn't want whatever I put in here to melt and start oozing out and making a mess in the case and I could just imagine uh, really how horrible that could be so if there is some kind of failure because of the heat I don't want it to be what I'm doing here so I looked at different kinds of waxes and the temperatures they melt at and one of the hottest melting waxes of all is beeswax and uh, beeswax is a natural material so I thought well maybe beeswax isn't suitable because natural things like that organic products they can decay they can oxidize, turn to powder, dry out, crack, deteriorate in one way or another. And uh, I looked it up and they have found beeswax in like old tombs or maybe it was the pyramids, I don't know. But uh, thousands of years old and it still maintains the properties of wax the way it was when it was new. It really never deteriorates. It's pretty remarkable stuff actually. It has a lot of neat properties when I was reading about beeswax, a lot of neat things that uh, that I read about them but uh, without going into all the neat things about beeswax the one thing I need it to do is to stay uh, semi-solid at least when it gets up to 130 degrees I found to be pretty much the nominal temperature of a hot car in a summer heat sealed up in the Sun at about oh, 105 to 110 degrees atmospheric Fahrenheit the cars get up to about 130 degrees. Well, beeswax melts at 145 degrees, another 15 degrees higher. So that's really perfect. So everything about beeswax just seems to suit my needs for this. I actually got some beeswax. I got this from Amazon and uh, I've seen beeswax before, but um, you know, I hadn't really handled it per se. And it is fairly hard stuff and it melts so hot. It's just kind of perfect. So, uh, yeah, interesting stuff. I look forward to working with it. But if there's something that you can think of that may be better than that, it'll harden without exposure to air. It really won't melt when it gets up to hot car temperature. It stays flexible. It won't stick to the rod. And it won't deteriorate over time. So, hey, I've found, I think I've found it here. So what I need, I don't have yet, but I need to get like a meat uh, injector uh, syringe. And I'd like to get a metal one so you know it can withstand the temperatures I want to get this to. And then I can, uh, you know, I can't remelt it. I'd have to make a good show of it the first time and make sure I get it in there all at once while it's hot because after that, uh, it's uh, the game's over. And I'll really be stuck at that point. But, uh, you know, I still have choices on the frets. You know, I could go in at different locations. But uh, if you can think of anything better, let me know. Well, hey, that's going to do it for now. We're just kind of chewing the fat and uh, thinking over a problem. And I've got a potential solution here. And uh, if you like and subscribe, you'll get to see how I do this. I'm looking forward to seeing how I do it. I've never done this before. So it's going to be pretty interesting for, for both of us. Uh, I've got some other projects too. And if I start another channel, uh, I'll let you know here. So uh, you can join me over there too once I get that going. But like and subscribe and join me next time. And we'll see you here at Beyond Guitars.